what's the good word, y'all? It's your boy DKB here. So let's get into the latest rumors surrounding the New York Jets, some in-house situations, and then, of course, the 2024 NFL Draft and how that pertains to what we have going on. Starting off with in-house options. Now, there's three hot names right now for the New York Jets. You're talking about John Franklin Myers, Will McDonald, and then, of course, our new acquisition from the Philadelphia Eagles in Hassan Reddick. Now, Hassan Reddick in and of itself, we're just still high off of the 2026 third round conditional pick that we were able to go out and get him. Um, I originally thought it was next year's third. I wasn't as happy, but being able to kick this so far down the road and get you a guy that's a certified pass rusher. I mean, the reason why the Philadelphia Eagles were able to stay in contention most of the time when we started to see their season feel like it was free falling was definitely due to Hassan Reddick, right? We've seen all of the stats by now. You know, the what is I think he was averaging 12 sacks a season the last four or five years, 50 to 55 sacks over the last five years, um, has been one of the more critical fourth down, um, uh, you know, pressure defenders uh, in the league the last handful of years. All of that means problems for John Franklin Myers and Will McDonald, right? Starting off with John Franklin Myers, he's a guy that I feel like a lot of the fan base hasn't really been as high on since he really kind of broke out for us the year that we gave him his extension. Uh, you take a look at what he offered, what he still offers, strong edge rush presence uh, when he is out there on the edge and he can give you some pass rush. And then when he reduces inside to that defensive tackle spot, you see him become uh, too strong for guards and centers. You see him too athletic and agile uh, for those that want to try to block those B and C gaps. Um, and he can get it done in a number of ways, right? Speed to power, power to speed, has a couple filthy moves, arm over, swipes, spins occasionally. He gets it done in a variety of manners. Um, and he's kind of workmanlike about it, right? Nothing's ever really flashy, which I think also uh, kind of takes away from his game a little bit. But for those that are really in a film room, he's doing quality work. Not to mention, again, the year that he got his extension, he was putting up Aaron Donald like pressure rates that season. So it kind of felt like Joe Douglas getting ahead of the free agency game and getting a guy that they wanted to reward for developing in-house, um, especially consider there weren't any other super major contracts going on other than the Quentin Williams one off the top of my head. Um, so it made a ton of sense. But Looking at what's going on with them now, you know, we have Hassan Reddick coming in with that cap number for him. I want to say it's uh, $14.6 million or something in that general range. Significant enough for us, right? You are already talking about the Jets being 2 to $3 million over the cap. John Franklin Myers has a $16.4 million cap hit this season. And again, the general feeling, and this isn't just a perspective. I've heard some analysts talk about this as well. They don't feel like that number is accurate for the productivity um, that John Franklin Myers generally gives the New York Jets. And I think he's extremely underrated because he does play both roles. It's not necessarily focusing in on just one. And the Jets have continuously, um, you know, given him more edge snaps than defensive tackle snaps, where I think he might be a little more effective, as we've seen in some of his elite years. Uh, all of that adds up to maybe him being walked out, right? A lot of people considering him the odd man out uh, in, in our edge rusher rotation. When you consider Hassan Reddick, John Franklin Myers, Will McDonald, Jermaine Johnson, um, Michael Clemens still, right? So um, for whatever reason, if we can't get a, a, some kind of deal done maybe to to get him to take a pay cut, he could be looking to get cut. I would think that this would be a problem, right? We spent all this time trying to find another veteran uh, edge rusher. But, you know, once we lost to Davion Clowney and, you know, the pivot we're seeing with Reddick here, I wouldn't think that they want to lose somebody else that they're extremely comfortable with and know what he can provide. Um, so unlikely, but stranger things would happen. We'll see what the Jets ultimately plan to do with that. Um I think the biggest piece of that would definitely be, will we give Hassan Reddick an extension uh, or not, right? I highly doubt he's going to take a pay cut because that's what he wasn't willing to do with the Eagles to stay with them. He's trying to get every dollar he can as he deserves right now. The Hassan Reddick effect is also impacting Will McDonald. 
a lot of people hate the man. It's unjust, right? It's not his fault that just decided to pick him at number 15 in the first round, but it was done. We know we had other needs. Um, the biggest hope that we can ask for is that he takes a Jermaine Johnson type evolution, right? And he is supposed to be training with him this off season, which I would say is particularly good because we've seen how Jermaine Johnson jumped from year one to year two. In year three, he already mentioned to the, you know, uh, prior or not prior, just after the season ended last year, that this is going to be his hardest year of work that he's ever put in because he doesn't just want to show he belongs in the league and can do well. He wants to dominate. We're talking all pro defensive player of the year type conversations. And so that'll be a huge, uh, a huge collaboration between our own New York Jets players and Will McDonald. If he is indeed, you know, eating, sleeping, and working out with Jermaine Johnson during the off season, you could hope, right? Will McDonald is a guy that uh, isn't as stout against the run, but as a pure pass rusher, he's definitely uh, levels above of what we were expecting from Jermaine Johnson, who had tools, didn't necessarily have a pass rush plan, but we've seen Will McDonald's skills work not only throughout the preseason. We've seen that lethal spin move uh, operate pretty effectively during the regular season once he got, uh, you know, his feet under him, maybe, you know, six to eight weeks into the season. Again, though, is a guy that first round prospect, you're expecting him to start. The ideal situation here is that he just becomes a heavily involved uh, defender in the, the defensive line rotation. But a lot of people think Hassan Reddick and or JFM could take away from any kind of significant snap increase. Will McDonald will show. I like to reference the fact that Jermaine Johnson wasn't expected to be a starter heading into his second year. He really just kind of took the job away, luckily due to Carl Austin being injured as well. But he was never able to really do anything to pull that job away from Jermaine Johnson once he had it in his grasp. So that's the hope. Will it happen? Who knows? Uh, but taking a look at some of our draft conversations and what's going on there, right? A couple recent pro days going on. The New York Jets took some time to meet with two very intriguing players. Uh, one in particular that I'm very fond of in Devontae Walker, the wide receiver, uh, UNC, right? Pro day recently done, meeting done. Uh, you take a look at his offseason, though. He was rising high after finally having the NCAA violation turned over. I personally think that he's a huge reason Drake May's stock is as high as it is. Taking that aside, though, his offseason hasn't necessarily been a roller coaster. It's just kind of been down. A terrible... Excuse me, a terrible senior bowl for him. Not a great combine either. Um, you talk about all of the drop problems, which isn't a, a, a symptom of what you really see on film with him. So it was very concerning. His pro day, though, seems to have kind of alleviate, alleviated a lot of those concerns. I heard a lot of people saying that he caught everything during his pro day. You take a look at what he could be coming into the league just in year one, a speed threat that provides, uh, you know, chunk yardage for you as a rookie. And the best part is, is that even though he might be rebuilding his uh, image, if you will, uh, with the, with the pro day that he recently had, he's a guy that could have been in the mid to late first round conversation to mid second round, maybe at worst. He could drop into day three for us. I'm a guy that's willing to take a flyer on him in, uh, you know, the third round. I think he could turn into a quality number one type wide receiver still. And the fact that he doesn't have to be anything close to that with the Jets already having Garrett Wilson on the roster, I think is a huge plus, let alone all of the other weapons and stuff. He wouldn't be heavily relied upon and he can kind of sit behind a guy like Mike Williams as well. There's a lot of pluses to this situation. I would jump on it immediately. You take a look at the other guy, and he has the more intriguing story just because he's never played a drop in college. Cornerback Quantez Diggers. Keep in mind, guys, this is a position of need for the Jets, an underrated one. We know we have the best trio in football, but going into 2025, I believe um, Sauce Gardner and Michael Carter II may be the only guys under contract, um, and you don't really want Michael Carter the second playing on a lame duck year, right? Um, I think I might be getting that wrong, but either way, we have one or two at most 
cornerbacks under contract for 2025. You're going to need some fresh blood there, right? Brandon Echols could be a guy that potentially resigns, but he may look for a starting opportunity elsewhere. Um, and then Bryce Hall left us, right? So you want to rebuild uh, um, you know, the covers there, make sure you have that depth. And Quantez Diggers is a guy that at least has pro experience to his name, right? He was maybe the second best cornerback at Shrine Bowl, not only throughout the week of practice, but also um, the game in and of itself. He didn't get a chance to win MVP or any huge accolades there, but he showed that uh, he has top quality or at least borderline top quality traits to help him out in his migration into the NFL. Interesting background for him. He's been a riser throughout the whole process. Dropped out of college, has some personal stuff, let alone some other issues that happened. Played in the fan control football league in 2022. And then in 2023, he joined the Canadian Football League, Toronto Argonauts. He became defensive rookie of the year and an all-star at all at the same time, right? And a lot of what you're going to hear about, um, uh, Stiggers here is that not only is he very sticky in coverage, he also seems to find a way to excel in zone coverage, can make a ton of plays on the ball. He had five interceptions in the CFL last year, and uh, he didn't show anything to be problematic. One of the things that I liked most is that he's played in so many different settings now that he's been able to show he, he can pick up and excel right away, right? You talk about the changes in field from the Fan Control Football League to the Canadian Football League to the Shrine Bowl, right? Smaller, shorter, wider fields, etc. It hasn't mattered. He's found a way to show, go out there and get his physical traits uh, and experience on film. And he's a guy that could be a perfect developmental prospect behind our trio right now. Especially if we have to lose one of them, you can kind of feel confident about him picking up in year one and running with some additional games if he needs to step in, but then becoming a future cornerback for us, whether that's in the slot or on the boundary. Then you have just the generic NFL draft conversations for us, right? A lot of people want us to cap off our major offseason with, you know, the ton of splash moves we made, the high profile signings by trading up. Finishing this up with either one of the two best wide receivers and Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, who's now kind of entered that conversation pretty consistently, or they want us to secure what many people think is the best tackle in the draft in Joe Alt. There's conversations for all of those. I'll leave that for um, <laughs> Jess Fly Squad. It's coming back uh, this time on Fridays. Uh, so we'll be having a lot of that conversation this Friday coming up. And then you have the other conversation. We had the recent rumors that the New York Jets want a quarterback needy team to trade up. This was per ESPN's Rich Samini, who I guess got this via uh, Dove Kleiman or Kleeman is the name that I've seen. Um, a lot of this would probably be likely dependent on a team not wanting to risk losing out on a Michael Penix Jr. or a Bo Nix. I think the other three guys um, or four guys, I should say now, Drake May. Jane Daniels, Caleb Williams, and then J.J. McCarthy. All of those guys seem like they may be a top 10 lock now just with the consistent, uh, you know, hype that's been going on, especially in J.J. McCarthy's end. So all of this works out in the, the Jets' favor. I think I would still prefer to trade down, uh, but it depends on who's on the board. I would still love to see a Olu Fashano in green and white, uh, but I love a lot of these right tackles as well, and I don't have a preference between left and right. Um, I think you can go out and, and still get a future above average starter uh, on, on either one of these sides. So ultimately, let me know what you guys think, though, the whole Will McDonald JFM situation. Are you cutting one of these guys? Do you, Or I should, should say, are you cutting JFM? Do you expect Will McDonald uh, to push to be a starter? And then uh, what are you thinking about draft options here? Uh, definitely in that, that late day two, early day three range. And I'll catch you guys again. Peace.